of First Baptist Church in Lincoln Gardens and also uh, the founder and the author of D Free, Dr. Soros. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everybody. I am uh, thrilled to be here, and I want to thank God, first of all, for waking me up this morning. This is my second of three commitments uh, within a four hour period, actually a three hour period. So I'm not gonna say like the old folk used to say, I thank God for closing me in my right mind because I'm not sure I'm in my right mind. <laughs> uh, I wanna thank Adrian and, and uh, his whole team, Gene, everybody for the positive community. You know, I, um, I was trained to do civil rights. And you have to know, back in the day, that had we depended on the Star Ledger, or the Home News, or the New York Times, or the Daily News, or ABC, NBC, there was no CNN. Had we depended on those media organizations, there would have been no civil rights movement. We had no Twitter, we had no Facebook, we had no email, we had no Instagram. Yet all over the country, young people were sitting in lunch counters, older people were marching on county courthouses, churches were teaching people about civil disobedience. And you younger people should be asking the question, how did they do it? How did they even know there was a mass meeting downtown. How, 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 did, how did they do it? The major media certainly did not carry the story until way after the fact. But I mean in the early days when, when Thurgood Marshall was a lawyer running around collecting funds that the NAACP had raised, when, when Mary McLeod Bethune was cooking pies in South Carolina to raise money to send kids to college. How did they know what was happening? And the answer is through black media. We had black newspapers. We had black radio stations. And the black radio stations and the black newspapers that we had existed for the purpose of being the communications arm of the movement. They, they, they weren't talking apples and we were looking for oranges. They, they weren't talking sports and we were talking struggle. Every African American media organization from the Afro American to the Chicago Tribune to WLIB, WNJR, WWRL, black disc jockeys knew their role. And it wasn't until after the Civil Rights Movement that black media organizations decided they just wanted to make money. And they basically became ways for the owners to make money independent of the messages that black people needed to hear. And so today you have black radio stations that won't say a word about issues that relate to black people. Their job is to sell products. There was a black communications company that had asked me to do some commentary on D Free. They liked the message, and of course, the commentary always starts with uh, specifics. I don't like to just talk philosophy, I like to talk specifics. And one of the specifics, Adrian, that I talk about are these payday loans. You know, in Ohio, if you take out a payday loan, you'll see on their website that the interest rate starts at 700% starts. And when you go to Advance America, it says right on the website, here is, here is the interest rate equivalent of our loans. So if you take out a $100 loan, it'll cost you 700% up to a $1,000 loan, which is 800%. So I went on and I did my pilot commentary talking about payday loans. They did not air the pilot and never called me back. And when I wondered what was going on, I realized that the payday industry is a major advertiser on that black network. 
And there are very few African American media organizations and very few black political figures that have not been bought by the payday loan industry. And so it's getting harder and harder to find media organizations, talented people who have invested their personal resources but still perceive themselves as being responsible to be the communications arm of the movement to empower black people. And that's why I love Adrian and Jean. That's why positive community matters. Yeah. And, and the reason we don't understand it today is because there's so little of it. You know, we understand McDonald's because Burger King's across the street. You know, we understand Harvard because Yale is trying to steal their students. The, the reason black people in New York and New Jersey and hopefully soon Pennsylvania don't really understand the positive communities because in, in many ways it is the only one of its kind. They don't have any naked girls on the center pole or semi-naked. They don't have a gossip section, you know, trying to figure out, you know, uh, where Kanye and Kim went to dinner. You know, there's no, there's, no, there's no silly section in positive community. And if we don't leave here with anything else, we ought to leave here with a commitment to doing what we can, how we can, where we can to support this, our only instrument in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area to tell the news we need to know and to share the stories that are important to our future. Give them another round of applause. So, Adrian, thank you so much. Gene, thank you so much for what you do. Now, I didn't plan to say this because I, I didn't know he would be here, but some 30 years ago when, when they were laying cables throughout our cities to give us an expanded opportunity to have visual media and to create an alternative to, uh, to commercial television, the cable industry was uh, emerging in a way that essentially uh, ignored black people, essentially. Bob Johnson kind of snuck his way in, bought a little UFA, UHF station, and parlayed that into BET. And then, of course, BET decided that the business model of choice was to get free content and sell high paid advertising. And so the free content was produced by the music industry. And so you had naked girls uh, dancing. And, and Bob became a billionaire off BET. And as a result, we, we, have, um, we have the new BET owned by Viacom. But John Barry Washington in Newark leveraged his uh, brilliant business mind with the uh, political climate of the times, and John said that if there's gonna be a proliferation of, of TV outlets, then there ought to be at least one that is dedicated to the proposition that pro positive community is, and John pulled together a team and formed really the only African-American owned cable company in the country, and he did so not to get rich, because John could get rich any number of ways, he did so because he knew that our people would be plugged in since we watch more TV than anybody else and formed a cable company that, that really paved the way in many ways for the political power that Newarkers have today. So John, good to see you. John Barry Washington. Down there on, uh, down there on Central Avenue. Now his, his company was a block away from Central Cadillac. You know, and, and when I, when I, part of why I'm here is because when I became a preacher, I, I was licensed to preach in uh, 1975, and when I was licensed to preach, uh, I was driving a Chevy. And uh, Deputy Mayor of Newark, big, big time Newark athletic hero, Lou Perkins, you remember Lou, Lou worked right, right down the street from you at Central Cadillac, and Lou had heard that I was now a preacher and Lou saw me coming up Central Avenue driving in my Chevy, and Lou pulled me aside and said, I heard you preaching now. I said, I am. He said, well, you can't drive a Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> You're a preacher, you gotta drive like a preacher. 
And, and I, in the most ignorant way I could, I said, you're right. <laughs> and three days later, I'm driving a Cadillac, you know, took half my salary. Uh, I had no savings, no insurance. I had no pension, no retirement. I had no savings, no nothing, but I had a Cadillac, Tom. Thanks to Lou Perkins. And uh, as a result, I went deeper in debt, was living far beyond my means, and uh, as Luke chapter 15 said, the prodigal son, when he came to himself, he said, I can do better than this. When I came to myself, I sold my Cadillac, which was now a Lincoln, and bought a two-door Honda that was three years old, stick shift, AM radio, and no air conditioner. <laughs> and I took what many people would call a few steps back so I could take many steps forward, and, and I thank God for that discovery. I am, uh, say this and then I'll, one more thing and I'll come back to that. I am a uh, proponent of the community bank. I'm on the board of the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York. We have $120 billion in assets. Uh, on that board is about eight bank presidents. All of them are presidents of community banks. And our job is to provide liqui liquidity to the banking industry uh, mo most of the banks that borrow from us are community banks. I, I have a relationship with a local bank, the real estate that I own, I've bought from local banks. I, I, like, I like community banks because they play a particular role, but I want to tell you this, the only bank, there's only about six banks left, huge banks, Bank of America, Citibank, uh, Wells Fargo, you know, there's a few, but the only bank that is a large bank that provides for me what the community bank does on steroids is Wells Fargo. Now, I would tell you that I, Wells, Fargo, Wells Fargo has this unique blend of uh, international banking capacity and local bank atmosphere. And so when I, when I, when I started this uh, deep free venture, uh, all, uh, what, what I did was I set up a, a for-profit and a non-profit. I'll, I'll explain that model sometime when you come to church. But, 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 uh, but my for-profit enterprise partners with companies and generates money that can go into my non-profit taxes and foundation. And my non-profit taxes and foundation does, we do training for free for churches, we give away books to people that can't afford them, we're doing development in, in, in Jamaica, Haiti, Ghana, and Liberia. At our conference, we'll have the former ambassador from Jamaica to the U.S. who will come and talk about the implications for D-Free in the Caribbean. And, and our nonprofit foundation is called the D-Free Global Foundation. We're going, we're going to be doing micro-lending in Ghana, we're doing a youth leadership camp between African kids and, and, and African American kids. And when I went to set that up, I opened that account at Wells Fargo. Because the name of the foundation and the function is D Free Global Foundation. And while community banks have some benefits, if you really, if you really want to deal with the world as we know it, you need a bank that's everywhere. And you need a bank that's the same everywhere. And what I like about Wells Fargo is if I'm in California, Alabama, or New Jersey, South Jersey, North Jersey, there's a culture in Wells Fargo Bank that goes way back, and that culture is such that it is conducive for doing business. And so I'm not surprised that my friends from Wells Fargo are here. I thank God for them, and uh, I want you to take seriously the fact that they're not just here. Wells Fargo, one out of every four people in America have some product with Wells Fargo. So the fact of the matter is, they really don't need us the way we define need. You know, when we say need, we needed something yesterday. Tell the truth. But well, Wells Fargo is going to be here until the Lord comes. So if you want a solid banking relationship, you may. All right, doctor. <laughs> All right, doctor.